Showtime. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland, and welcome to Night Fright. I'm excited tonight, folks. Living history tonight, Mark Lane is our guest. Let me read this. A few of the people that he's worked with, he's organized for, and he's influenced over his lifetime. President John Kennedy, he was the campaign manager in New York. Martin Luther King, he organized a rally in Harlem. Yeah, Dr. King. Bobby Kennedy knew very per, knew personally. He called him when he was a freedom writer. Oprah Winfrey. Uh, Paul McCartney, he was the lawyer for the American Indian Movement, Wounded Knee, 1973. We're going to get there tonight, too. Burt Lancaster, Donald Sutherland. Uh, he wrote the movie screenplay for Executive Action. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, William Buckley, he got the House Select Committee on Assassinations going, Oliver Stone, Dick Gregory. Now listen to this, folks. When um, Dick Gregory ran for the presidency, I think it was in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken. 68. Thank you, my friend. Mark Lane was the vice president uh, candidate. So he ran for the uh, vice presidency of the United States. Yeah, we didn't uh, win. What happened was we had peaked too soon. You peaked too uh, There you go. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, Pauline Perret is doing a wonderful documentary on his life called Citizen Lane, and we're going to be talking about all that tonight. And you know, folks, if I had to continue with all the people that uh, Mark has influenced, we wouldn't have a show. Um, so what I'm going to do is start the show in just a second, but I just want to say that had Mark lived 2,000 years ago, I fully suspect, people, that he would have been an apostle for Jesus Christ. And, uh, well, how did the Gospels go, Mark? Is it Matthew, Mark? Strap that's, in a, that's, that's a different Mark, actually. <laughs> Strap in and hang on. Here we go. There is a time for question. There is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Welcome one and all, welcome one and all. We're going to have some fun tonight as well as some serious moments. Mark Lane is our guest. He's got a new book out called Citizen Lane and The Last Word. Both books you can get very easily as always, folks, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest book cover and that'll take you right to a place where you can order the books from the comfort hey. of your own home. Hi, Mark. How you doing? He's Good. You know, we've been talking for years. I know. But it's always been on radio. This is the first time I ever saw you. First time you ever saw me, except for about an hour ago when we wanted to see if the connection works, which it seems to be working really well. I mean, this is the first, the first Skype show I've ever done. And this and is the first interview I've ever done about my autobiography, Citizen Lane. Well, let's jump in right away, shall we? And by the way, Mark's uh, via Skype, of course, from Virginia, where he lives. And let's jump in right away about Citizen Lane. You know, I, I touched on... Um, um, President John Kennedy and how you were the uh, the uh, campaign manager in New York City. How did that come about? Um, in Los Angeles, there was a Democratic convention in 1960 to pick a candidate. A lot of liberals supported Adlai Stevenson. I was with John Harrington, where I lived in Yorkville, New York. John Harrington was a terrific guy, uh, an Irish lad who I really loved. and. Uh, he was older than I am. He was a mentor to me. And he was a strong supporter of John Kennedy. We talked about it. So I was one of those few liberals in New York supporting John Kennedy. It was called For JFK Before LA, means before the Los Angeles uh, Convention. And um, when he won, he realized uh, when, he came, when Bobby and he came to New York, there was a big problem there. There was the old wine Tammany Hall group, which was actually organized crime to a large extent. And there were the new reformers organized by Eleanor Roosevelt, 
Governor Herbert Lehman, Tom from Letter, me, and a few other people. And uh, Bobby came and said, I would like to meet with the reformers. I set up a meeting uh, in an apartment that he, he and John had and Teddy had in New York. I said, what is this apartment? It's on Park Avenue. And one of his aides, a dear friend, said, uh, this is for, they have liaisons on occasion. Okay, I don't probe any further. In any event, I got all the reformers together and we met with Bobby. And uh, of course they said, what will happen if your brother's elected, will he support the reform movement? And he said, I just want my brother to be elected. I don't care if blood runs in the streets of New York after that, it's not our concern. Of course they were horrified. All these liberals are horrified. And I met with them, they said, he's so ruthless we know it. And I said, did you hear what he said? He won't take a position. You can never expect the president of the United States to be supporting a reform insurgent group in the Democratic Party against the organization. But he said, we won't take a position. Uh, maybe his language was a little over the top, but the meeting was pretty clear to me. So we convinced the reform movement to become strong supporters of John Kennedy. And so Bobby came to see me and said, we got a problem. We got Carmine de Sapio and Tammany Hall, and we got the reformers. Uh, we, we want you guys to work together. And we want, John and I want you to represent the reformers. Will you do that? And I said, yes. And we worked together the best we could. Uh, the Sapia wasn't all that <laughs> cooperative, but we worked together. And then uh, I was running for the New York State Legislature. John came to the district, John Kennedy, and endorsed me. And I worked with him in the campaign. It was really quite a remarkable experience. What was it about John Kennedy that uh, you admired? Uh, he was different. I mean, he was not an old line politician. Mm. He was inspiring. He was one of the best speakers running that I've ever heard in my lifetime. Roosevelt, I was just a little kid then, but I heard Roosevelt, he was on the radio. We didn't have TV then. He was marvelous. And then was John Kennedy. He was on television. Uh, since then, we've had Barack Obama. So it's a whole new standard. But until that moment, it was John Kennedy. And I like what he had to say. Uh, about how things would be changing if he was present, tell the world out there there's a new way, America, America is a new country now in terms of foreign affairs. And I did, appreciated what he did. Did you believe that he believed in what he was saying, his idealism? It wasn't yes, just I, a line that he was pitching, in other words? Well, you never know. But I, I did believe that. I believe that there was his background in the... Uh, in the United States Senate, there are things that indicate that. I know his father was uh, very right wing and influenced the kids, but uh, he seemed to have moved away from that. And I, uh, I appreciated what he said. And I, I met with him a few times, and I thought that he was. Uh, the way I met with him is, they, they agreed to have pictures taken of every candidate for state legislature with John Kennedy, and I went there. Carmine de Sapio, the organized Democratic leadership arranged for the photographer, went there, had my picture taken, and then they said, I got to tell you some bad news. The photographer said, the only picture which did not come out was yours with John Kennedy. So next time Bobby came to town and asked me how things are going, I said, fine. He said, how's the picture? I said, mine was the only one that didn't come out. He said that, and I won't use the explicatives, but there were several of them. Uh, John's coming here to the Waldorf story in eight days or whatever it was. Be there, bring a photographer, bring two photographers. And so I went there and I had a chance to chat with Kennedy and he was really discouraged by what DeSapio had done. He said, I hope it won't influence you. I said, listen, we're supporting you. We, are, we know about DeSapio, we're supporting you. And he said, okay, I will be neutral if I'm elected. And I got elected to the state legislature then. And that was part of the experience with John Kennedy, who I really admired. Me too. Folks, I love this guy. I could sit and talk with Mark Lane for hours. The stories he has, the real life history. He was there in the trenches, folks, for all these stories that he's going to tell us tonight. He's got two books full of them. Uh, this first one is Citizen Lane. That's his true life story. And by the way, Polly Perrette's making a documentary with the same title. And the other one it was is... Her, it was, I should say, it was her title. And, and I was chose, I had a whole series of titles, none of them were very good. And I said to my publisher that um, Paul Perrette's doing a documentary called Citizen Lane. Let's use it. And I said, well, it's her title. I, I got to ask her. So I said, can I use your title? And she 
because she was in a documentary film called Citizen Lane. And she thought for a moment, she said, yes, with my, I want you to explain in your book how you stole my title with my love and my permission. That's on the first page. Absolutely. That quote, it's right quote, there, folks. Quote. But I want to yeah. say something people can't. Please, please. Okay. Because I, that's where we are now. That's where you are. That's where I'm talking to. Uh, during the war in Vietnam, there were uh, a number oh, of... Yeah, oh, Canada. There were a number of Vietnamese pilots in the United States for Colonel Key. And they were... 10% of the Air Force was in Texas practicing, learning. And one of them called me and said, I don't want to go back and kill my own people in Vietnam. Can you get me sanctuary in the United States? And I said, the United States is um, much, pretty much responsible for that war there against the people of Vietnam. Uh, we can't do anything. I said, call me back. They called, he called me back and I said, I, if, you, if we can work out an underground way and you come to where I was in Washington, I'll find a way. I'll take you to Canada. I believe that's a humane country. And I think they will give you asylum. He came with two people, and we went through this whole thing. And I wrote a chapter in my book. One of the ones I'm most proud of is called Oh Canada. And it tells the story of how I got a large number, a large number of pilots, a good por portion of the Air Force that was forced to kill their own people, to come and end up in Canada. And this is, I just want to read one sentence from my book. The title of the chapter is Oh, oh Canada. Canada. Chapter ends. 16. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Oh, this, I hope this chapter ends in Citizen Lane. Thank you, O Canada, for loving your neighbors and supporting their hopes, not their fears. So that is my thanks to the people of Canada. That's why I'm doing your show, which is the first one I've done about my book. Thank you, Mark. And um, in all sincerity, I sincerely appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your stories with everybody watching and listening right now who are primarily students. And it is essential. What I want to get across tonight, you know, we're going to have some fun too, folks, and we're going to be laughing and stuff, but right now is a poignant oh, Are we having fun now? Absolutely. But I want to get across, folks, okay. a yeah. single person can achieve all this and change the world. Mark Lane is just such a person. You can do that too. And that's what I want to get across tonight. That's why I wanted Mark on the show to tell you that, no, you know, you don't have to be apathetic about change in the world. You can go out there and be the change. What is it? Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Mark is living proof of that. We're going to no, get that's, to that. I'm glad you Please. picked that up because that is why I wrote my autobiography. Yeah. I talked to my wife and others and they said, you know, your autobiography will tell people that they can change things. Yes. The book is not about book is not about me. The book is about how I react with all of these folks and things actually change. And um, it, it, it's based upon, in my view, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's statement. I, I've read every biography, his autobiography, everything about Mahatma Gandhi. I've been greatly influenced by him. And he said, strength does not come from physical capacity it comes from an indomitable will and that is what i believe and that is what i'd like everyone to understand it's true we can all change things everybody can change things yes sir absolutely folks the book of course citizen lane uh last word the indictment of the cia and the murder of jfk www.nightfrightshow.com click on the book covers take it right to a spot where you can order both books from the comfort of your own home and i urge you all to do that by the way if the kids are around bring them in the room you're going to appreciate what mark uh has as a message for them uh it will inspire them folks uh without question talk about being inspired it's a great segue into dr martin luther king and how you met and worked with him uh, this is an you know folks living history tonight um he walked with the greats he is a great can you tell us about dr martin luther king sir yeah well i i met uh dr king i was in marches with him uh and uh one of the times I met him accidentally was at Nathan's 
in Brooklyn. Do you know about Nathan's, the hot dog? Sure, place? sure, absolutely. This was the original Nathan's. It was about 100 years old by then. I think that a sign up said 75 years, uh, but uh, that was a long time. That was a little while ago. And he was there with Ralph Abernathy and kids. And I don't know which were his kids and which were Ralph Abernathy's kids, but there were a lot of kids there. And we went up, and I was there with my mother, and my mother. And I've met Dr. King before. My mother said, my son is very famous. Oh, God. But, you know, mothers. And uh, I loved her. And she really, one of the greatest things that ever happened, the greatest thing that happened to me was having Harry A. Lane and Elizabeth Brown Lane be my mother and my father. They didn't always agree with every position I took, but they always supported everything that I did, that my brother, who just died recently, who was a high school teacher his whole life, that my sister, who was a college professor at UVA for many years. Everything we did, they supported. And they never said to us the words that being fair and just to everyone is our way, the American way. It should be our way. They never used their words, those words. They just lived them every day. And, uh, and that's why if I've ever tried to think about why I'm, what, what have I done? I don't know how much it's been, but what have I done and why have I done it? It's because I've learned that from my parents. Mm, God bless them. God bless them. Okay, can we talk about the the uh, Harlem uh, organization when you organized a rally for Dr. King in Harlem a little bit? Yeah, okay. You said a boat. And, you know, Mark Twain said, the United States and England are two great countries separated by a common language. The United States and Canada are two great countries separated by a bout and a boot. That's all that separates us. <laughs> yes. Uh, Dr. King had come to Harlem, and there was a small group of people invited to meet him, very elite small group. And, uh, and I talked to Reverend Eugene St. Clair Calendar, Mid-Harlem Community Parish, right down the block in Harlem, right down the block from the Trace Hotel. And we said, why don't we invite Dr. King back? but not to meet a small group of 15 people, but to meet the community. And so we did. I, I called him and asked him, he said, yes. Where will it be? I said, we're talking about an outdoor rally. And so we could do it in front of the Hotel Teresa, 125th and 7th Avenue, the heart of Harlem. And uh, I knew the Democratic Party, I'd been part of it, but there was Larry Gerosa who was the uh, controller who owned the big Gerosa construction company. And I said, uh, we don't have any money for a budget for this. Could you give us one of your gigantic flatbed trucks as a stage? And he did. Right behind us was Chuckie Ray Robinson's lounge. Okay, right behind us was uh, uh, Chuckie Ray Robinson's uh, uh, lounge. And I went in there and said, could we have an electrical line? And so we had all of these things done. And then Dr. King came and spoke. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people were there. And it was the first time I'd heard him in person. Uh, and it was mesmerizing. And it was like a Beethoven symphony. All you knew is you did not want it to stop. Please don't end yet. And, but it had to. And people were just begging for more. It was just, so that's the first time I met Dr. King. Of course, later when he was assassinated, uh, I looked into it because the truth had not been told about the murder of Dr. King. Well, let's stay on that and let's talk about when you represented James Earl Ray. By the way, folks, uh, Mark Lane is our guest tonight, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest book covers. All these stories are in these books, folks. Uh, you owe it to yourself, to your kids to get these books. Um, James Earl Ray, folks, for those of you that are too young to remember, was the purported assassin of Dr. Martin Luther King. Can we talk about when you represented him, sir? Yeah, he was represented by Percy Foreman, and he Percy Foreman said, they're going to execute you. You have no chance unless you plead guilty. He said, I didn't do it. He said, plead guilty anyway. And he said, I won't, I won't do it. And Percy said, well, I'm going to do it for you. There's no way you can stop me. The judge said, you cannot have other counsel. I'm your counsel. If there's a trial, let the jury know I think you're guilty. That's the defense lawyer on the take. And so what happened was that James already pleaded guilty, he was sentenced to uh, many years in prison. Uh, I looked into it because I knew Martin, as I said, and was convinced that Ray did not do it. And I went to see Ray and I started a campaign and wrote a book about the uh, murder of Dr. King. I went to the 
Congress. I was, lived in Washington, D.C. at that point, right across the street from the Supreme Court, which is just a, a block or two from the House of Representatives in the United States Senate. I knew some people in the House and the Senate, mostly the House, Schweiker in the Senate. And um, I went to see them and said, there's got to be an investigation mm. into the murders of President Kennedy and Dr. King. And they said, well, first guy I talked to, Herman Badillo, I knew him because he was a kid in my district when I was elected to the state legislature. Later, he became a congressman. He said, you know, we're not a grand jury. We can't investigate murders. I said, yeah, but uh, this is not just a murder. Uh, you got to do this. He said, nobody will support this resolution you have. I wrote a resolution to set up the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Yeah. 19, said, late 1970s, folks. Sorry, Mark. And Yeah, thank you. And then he... Uh, he said, no one will sign it. I said, how about you? He said, I'll sign it. I spent the next months going to every member of Congress. I got more than 100 signatures. We finally got it passed. We got it passed. And uh, then the committee was set up. And it actually concluded that in all likelihood, there had been a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy and a conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King. That's the last word by the American government on the case. It's not the Warren Commission or anything else. Uh, and it... I called upon the Department of Justice, now that America had spoken through its legislature, that there probably was a conspiracy to kill each of them to investigate. That's a long time ago. They haven't uh, decided to do that yet. Unbelievable. Eh? Any idea why they're still dragging their feet on that? Now, as you just said, a lot of people don't realize that the last word from the American government was that there was a probable conspiracy. In each case. In each case, any idea yeah. why they're still dragging their feet? What is so explosive, Mark, that it still has to be covered up to this day? Maybe the fact that the CIA killed President Kennedy. That could cause some problems if people knew that to be true. And I wrote a book which, basically, which said that. And I presented all the documents, all of the evidence, showing that the uh, CIA was involved in... And there's new material out now by others. But uh, this book came out just a little while ago. But... Uh, showing that the CIA was setting up Lee Harvey Oswald as the fall guy for the assassination long before the assassination took place. Mm -hmm. they, were, they, were, they were manufacturing stories about Oswald being in, in Cuba, which was not true, before the assassination, so that when the assassination took place, they could say Oswald had been to Cuba, he was looking for a permit to go to Russia, and then they could then say, the CIA, as they did say to the Warren Commission, Oswald had been to the Cuban embassy and the Soviet embassy in Mexico City just before he killed President Kennedy. If this ever comes out, America will believe the Russians, the Cubans killed him. It will be World War III. The only way to prevent this from happening they say Oswald did it, he did it alone, and closed the case. And that is what Warren told the young lawyers who came there, Arlen Specter and these other guys who made a career based upon their line about the Kennedy assassination. He became a senator in New York, in, New York, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so they, this is how they covered it up. They said Oswald did it and did it alone. And Warren met with these young lawyers. It's a transcript. We have it now. We've had it for years, but it was top secret at the time, in which he said, truth is, Warren, truth is not our goal here. 100 million Americans could die. We have to do something. In other words, he believed the CIA story that Oswald had been there. Oswald had not been there. So he was trying to save America because he didn't know what the facts were. Mm -hmm. I didn't bother to look into the facts. In any event, yeah. the CIA killed President Kennedy. We're going to go right there in a second, folks, but I just want to explain a few things. Uh, Earl Warren was the Chief Justice of the United States at that time. Right. right after the president was killed, President Kennedy. You got that right. Everybody here says incorrectly, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. But you're right. He was Chief Justice of the United States. That's the correct title. Okay. Thank glad, you. To hear from, glad to hear from Canada. I don't hear it in America. Okay. Just don't ask me to say about. And okay. um, <laughs> I, I just want to let you know that right after the assassination, all these rumors were flying around that there could be a KGB connection. Um, as Mark just said, they were trying to make it look like Oswald had gone down there, met with the head KGB assassin. Um, in Mexico, uh, there was rumors floating around that it was Cuba. And let's not forget the climate of that time. It was only just over a year later 
of the Cuban Missile Crisis when we came that close, that close to nuclear holocaust. And I'm not kidding. So with these rumors flying around, um, Johnson said, well, listen, as Mark just said, we've got to cover this thing up that it was a conspiracy. We've got to say that it was one lone nut assassin and he acted on his own instinctively uh, just off the cuff like that. So Earl Warren was asked to lead something called the Warren Commission. Now, most of you remember 9-11. And right after 9-11, there was a commission set up again by the government to investigate 9-11. The same thing happened with the Kennedy assassination. A commission was set up. It was called the Warren Commission after Earl Warren's name. And well, the, the, official please, title, the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, but everybody called the Warren Commission because he was sure. chairman. It was set up by Lyndon Johnson. That's the, that's the crucial part because yes. that's why it's called the President's Commission. Lyndon Johnson was on CBS later, later, yep. had his own book out. Mm -hmm. And he said, I always believed there was a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. He's a guy that set up the Warren Commission, now agreeing with the rest of us. I think 80% of the American people believe that now. Probably nobody in Canada ever believes the story that the government presented here, but uh, uh, now 80% in America do not believe it. And also- so it's Sorry. I was going to say also President Johnson, just as the book was being released, the, the Warren report was being released, there was 26 volumes of it, also said he didn't believe the single bullet theory. That's right. And that well, who was, could? Yeah, who could? I mean, you know, yeah. the, 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 there's a reason why it's called the single bullet or the magic bullet, because virtually it disappears and comes back and goes forward and down and up and just an yeah, it was It was in rush to judge in my first book that I gave it the name. The magic bullet. That's right. Mark was That's responsible for that. Yeah. Rush to judgment also, folks. Uh, as you can see, I'm a fan. <laughs> and I also have his movie Executive Action with Burt yeah. Lancaster in it, which was the first JFK, if you will, uh, in the early, I think it was 72 or 73 it came out, yeah. that said, no, indeed, folks, there was a conspiracy behind the Kennedy assassination. It's a low-budget film. I but, mean, to me, it's not a low budget. It was $600,000. It broke all records yes. in the history of America as a low budget film for six months. Then they pulled it. Yeah, because, it, you know, I mean, JFK came out in the 90s. And think of the um, uh, the furor around JFK when that came out. I mean, people were running and covering their heads. This was only 10 years after um, that this movie came out, and let me tell you, it was explosive. I remember I was just a kid, and I remember hearing about executive. Oh, you got to go see executive action. Uh, Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy, and Mark was right behind that. He wrote the screenplay, by the way, folks. You touched on somebody else. Let me just say, there's another Please. film that came out, and we should mention Oliver Stone's film, JFK. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which was. Uh, much better technologically in many ways uh big uh, the stars in it and it was um, and i met with oliver in mm -hmm. fact i have a film called just being finished now a rush to judgment a documentary and it has abraham bolden in it it has bob tannenbaum who's investigated the assassination for the uh, house select like committee on assassination and it's oliver stone in it and uh, i met with oliver uh, and uh, he said his life was almost destroyed when he knew JFK. That's my whole interview. He talks about that. Mm -hmm. I said, what? You made all the... He made... Every film he made was controversial. Platoon, uh, about the war in Vietnam. Yes, all sir. the films yeah. were controversial. Mm -hmm. And he was used to that. And he he had like 30 Academy Awards or something for various yeah. things that he had done. Uh, and did JFK. And he said he was almost destroyed by that. Uh, the, the people thought... The news media attacked him. Everyone attacked him. They said the, the uh, Washington Post sent people to do a review of the film before it came out, sneaked into the studios. I mean, he said it was it was like 1984, George Orwell's 1984. All of a sudden, I had made these controversial films in the past. I got all these awards. Now, it's like my, my life was over because of these attacks, because I did that. And that was a very good film. Oh, it it's sure a very was. Good film. Yeah. yeah, in filmmaking, it's ma it's a piece of ma it's a masterpiece. Yeah. That and Nixon with Nixon back yeah. to back, um, just master. I, 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 you know, he's a I, wonderful. Yeah. Oh, he's a amazing. wonderful filmmaker. 
and, Oliver Stone is a wonderful filmmaker. Oh, without question. And, you know, uh, any good art, folks, uh, you can watch it over and over again or look at it or listen to it over and over again, and you'll find new things in it every time. And this is what right. I find in Nixon, JFK, without question. There's new little pieces in there. The detail... Um, we're off subject, but I just want to tell you we're speaking with Mark Lane. Fault. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. And I fully expected this. Um, and this is what makes uh, great information uh, to be um, to be put out there for, for people uh, is when we go off tangent and off uh, script and things like that. He's got all kinds of great books. Rush to Judgment. Citizen Lane is his new one. Uh, By Executive Action. I got it. Uh, it's a great movie. You're going to really, really like that one. Last Word is another book that's just come out, folks. Um, we're going to talk some more about the CIA and uh, how they were behind the killing of President Kennedy and Plausible Denial that was out a couple of years ago uh, another great book and we're going to talk about that one as well www.nightfrightshow.com just click on tonight's guest book cover and order these things <laughs> there you go uh, Mark let's go back to the CIA and John Kennedy and the assassination and I should also mention folks Mark represented the interests of Lee Harvey Oswald in the Warren Commission and we were talked about rush to judgment Mark was the first guy to come out and say wait a second Wait a second. This Warren report is full of bunk. Um, I, 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 I knew John and worked with him and knew Bobby. And uh, when he was killed and the, the report, the, remember this, the Warren Commission report is nothing more than the original FBI report issued by J. Edgar Hoover the same day of the assassination. That's right. Oswald did it, did it alone. Well, the first thing I thought was it was the president of the United States. A lot of people might want him dead so when he's killed even if one person did all of the shooting which is not true even if oswald's the one person which is not true but even if that were all were true how do you know nobody paid him nobody helped him in advance how can you rule out a conspiracy without an investigation because the goal was to tell the american people one man did it and did it alone not to get the facts and that was the fbi report by j edgar hoover which the Warren Commission was merely a annotated copy of. It basically said the same things. Agreed, without question, folks. Um, let's go into that now. You had uh, written, um, a dis not a disclaimer, but you'd written a, a paper on how the Warren Commission got all the facts wrong, and um, you were trying to find a publisher for it, and you couldn't find a publisher for it. Can we talk yes. about... Um, yeah, I, I wrote Rush to Judgment. Yeah. It was a manuscript. And um, it, it wasn't... Um, I understood why a publisher might be, have a problem with it because okay. it could not possibly be a bestseller. It had 5,000 citations and footnotes and references. It was like a law book. It wasn't a best-selling book. It had no sex, nothing like that in it. It was, you know, I never thought it would be a best-selling book. But every publisher in America that I went to agreed to publish it. Everybody did. Then within two or three weeks, they said they could not. They'd been visited by the FBI or the CIA, in some cases both. So I ended up going to London, where I met with a Bodley head, a conservative old firm, 100 years old, and they said they would publish it. That was the first contract I ever had for Russia Judgment, was in England, not in the States. Hmm. Then when I came back, I got a phone call from Arthur Cohn at Holt Reinhardt and Winston, and he said, we're interested in your book. I said, good. He said, can you come in and see me? I said, sure. And he said, uh, we are going to publish the book. I said, good. He said, you don't seem too excited. I said, you're the 17th American publisher who said that to me. I hope you really publish it. He said, let me tell you this. I'm the, the chief editor here, but I don't own the company. If this company does not publish Rush to Judgment, I will resign. I will take every editor with me. And I will say to the American press, the American people at a press conference, that this is no longer a free country. We have no more First Amendment rights. It's the government, because I know why the other people turn it down. I know the FBI and the CIA had gone to them. If they, they can come to us, but if uh, we yield, that will be my position. I'll shake hands with you. We shook hands, and they published it. And I know it couldn't do well. It became the number one best-selling book, according to the New York Times, for the year 1966. And then it came out in paperback the next year, became the number one best-selling 
book in America, according to the New York Times, in paperback. So there was a market, obviously. People were really curious and interested. And every publisher in America had turned it down. The truth will find a way, folks. And don't forget that if you're out there in university right now and um, you're thinking that, ah, geez, you know, there's nothing I can do to change things. Mark Lane is living proof that you can because everything that has followed from his challenge of the Warren Commission and the President Kennedy assassination, everything is built on what Mark Lane wrote in Rush to Judgment. He was the first one, folks, to come out and say, uh, no, there's something amiss here. There is something seriously amiss. And yeah, I and of course, the reviewers said it was all speculation. It's not one word of speculation of the book. I don't say who did it. I don't guess about anything. I said, these are the facts. And uh, I could prove that clearly. And, and that's what the book said. And the American people picked it up and got it. And since then, nobody, since then, Two-thirds of the American people said they do not believe the Warren Report, and it's never gone below that number yet. Plausible Denial and Marita Lorenz. Can we talk about Marita Lorenz and how she plays into all this, sir? And then we'll get on to Patrick uh, Hemming after. Yeah. Well, there was a lawsuit brought by, uh, against a little newspaper, a little national right-wing newspaper in New York called The Spotlight, which indicated that uh, was written by Victor Marchetti, who had left the CIA, wrote his own book. And then he said that, in essence, that he didn't quite say it, but he implied that E. Howard Hunt of the CIA and the CIA may have been involved in the Kennedy assassination. Hunt sued the newspaper. They got a very bad lawyer down in Florida who represented them, was because that Hunt lived in Florida, where in the federal court is where it was tried. And Hunt won, got an award for $650,000, which seemed like it was a little excessive. The guy just got out of prison as a Watergate burglar. What, what was his reputation that had just been injured by this book? In any event, uh, they, I was not involved in that case. I didn't even know about it. I didn't even know that the case had taken place. And then they uh, got an appellate law firm, good firm, and they took it to the Court of Appeals, which is the next highest level after the United States District Court, called the Federal Court now, and uh, just below the Supreme Court. And the Court of Appeals reversed it because the instruction to the jury had been incorrect. Both lawyers, neither one very talented, agreed on the instructions. Instructions were wrong, and it was not the law. So the case got back. And I didn't have anything to do with the, with the appeal, with the success. I had nothing to do with it. But then the head of the newspaper, Willis Cardo, contacted me and said, uh, it's going up for a new trial. Will you represent us at the trial? I said, yeah, but, I, you know, it's true that the uh, standard is lack of actual malice, uh, which is a lot better for a defendant than just the truth. You have to just show lack of actual malice. But I said, I want to prove it's true. I want to call everybody. E. Howard Hunt, G. Gordon Liddy, David Phillips, around the Western Hemisphere for the CIA. All these people have made our lives a delight all of these years. I want to call them as witnesses. And if you let me do that, I'll do it for almost no fee. And I did that. And the jury's out for a short time. We won unanimously. In fact, the jurors uh, found that Hunt was not only responsible, in essence, and that the newspaper had not defamed him, but they also paid costs to the newspaper as a result of that. The forewoman came out and spoke to the press and said basically, you know, when Mr. Lane came to the court and his opening statement said, the Central Intelligence Agency of your government killed your president. I was just afraid that maybe the press saw me or the media or somebody saw me rolling my eyes in disbelief because it just seemed so preposterous to me. However, we are the only group of Americans, 12 of us, well, there were 14, but two alternates left. We're the only group of Americans who've heard all of the evidence, mm -hmm. had a judge determine what was relevant and what was admissible. We determined what the facts were. We're a privileged group of Americans, and unanimously, we agreed with the statement Mr. Lane had made. So that's how that was the next step in the case. And folks, just let me read this from the book um, that we're talking about tonight, Last Word by Mark Lane, our guest tonight. And uh, E. Howard Hunt, folks, uh, if a lot of you are going to recognize that name, some of you may not, was involved in the Watergate scandal in uh, 72, I believe it was. Anyways, what he had said was that he was not 
in Daly Plaza, 1963, the day the Kennedy was shot, E. Howard Hunt. So this is a brilliant lawyer, folks, Mark Lane. Listen to this. Quietly, in then a silent courtroom, I said, this is Mark talking, Mr. Hunt, why did you have to convince your children that you were not in Dallas, Texas on November 22nd, 1963? Hunt's reaction was visceral. He sat straight up in stunned silence. That's a smart lawyer, folks. Mark Lane's our guest tonight, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest book cover. That'll take you right to a spot where you can... Let me tell you why that was... Can I set that in a context? The fact is that at the first trial where Hunt won, as I said, it was not really well presented by uh, either side, certainly not by uh, the newspaper side, the defendant's side. In, in that, in that uh, case, uh, he said, in essence, that he was at home with his children. Um, he was not in Dealey Club, he was at home with his children. And uh, later on, um, he was changing that story about various places. He said he had been at a restaurant, well, uh, in Chinatown. I knew that restaurant. It was also a place that sold uh, Chinese uh, groceries and stuff. I'd been there a lot. And it didn't exist in 1963. Yes, it existed later when Hunt was using it as an alibi. It didn't exist at the time, November 1963. And it turned out that uh, his children, of course, were none of them came to the courtroom to testify. Mm. None of them came because he was not there. He was not with his children. His story about that was completely untrue when we could prove that. And uh, he took, had taken positions since there are two trials sometime apart. And when you don't tell the truth, it's very hard to keep things straight. If you tell the truth, it's a lot easier. But uh, he had no line to go on in terms of a truthful line. And so he had told one story at one trial, another story another time. And there we were uh, saying, see, what he had said at the first trial, when he knew he was going to win, was, how much money am I owed? I went to see my children. And they said, Dad, did you kill President Kennedy? How could you do that? He was heartbroken because it was on the front page of this newspaper. How could you? Okay, that was the story when he was looking for money. At the second trial, he said he was with his children on November 22nd. They were his alibis. Why would they ask him why he was in Dallas killing the president if they were with him the whole time? That's where that one line then follows. Absolutely. And uh, I should have put that in better context. I apologize. No, that's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Um, do you give much credence to uh, E. Howard Hunt's deathbed confession? E. Howard Hunt has made a tape, folks, uh, for his son, St. John Hunt, one of the children that Mark was just talking about. And essentially in the tape, he names Johnson and um, oh, several others, um, Frank Sturgis, as all being involved. And he kind of makes it sound like E. Howard Hunt makes it sound like he was only on the peripherals of everything on the outside looking in. Do you give any credence at all to his deathbed, quote unquote, confession on this tape? Well, that was with St. John, his son, who I've talked to since that time. We've had conversations. And um, I don't know if any of that is true. I mean, he was dying. He was under heavy medication. I don't know what he thought it would what purpose would serve maybe to take responsibility off himself and blame it on someone else. Uh, I don't see any evidence to show that Lyndon Johnson was involved in the Kennedy assassination. Believe me, if I saw it, <laughs> I would say it. And I haven't seen it it's all of these years now. I still haven't seen it. Doesn't mean it's impossible. I don't know who was behind it. I mean, it was the CIA, but I don't know the names of individuals, uh, who the CIA was reporting to, why they did that. Uh, Anything's possible, but I don't see any evidence that points to Linda Johnson. Yeah, either do I. I don't think uh, having spoken with Ted Sorensen, folks, uh, JFK's closest aide and speechwriter, and um, just the people around John F. Kennedy, if they had have seen a coup, they wouldn't have stood for it. There's not a chance. Um, even the the, um, uh, the the head of the Joint Chiefs of... Um, uh, what was his name? Oh, my goodness, it's escaping me at the time. Uh, he was handpicked by John F. Kennedy, a military fellow, and he would not have, uh, uh, Maxwell Taylor, he would not have stood by and allowed a coup to take place. So I just don't see that happening. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Patrick Hemming, this is a cloak and dagger story <laughs> that gives me chills. And I don't know how you had the chutzpah to stay there with him, but uh, can we tell that story, sir? It was a mistake on my part. I didn't do it on purpose. What happened is I was, uh, uh, Marita Lorenz 
had already testified that she was in the car going to uh, Dallas uh, with a two-car caravan in which they had the guns and they were going there to kill Kennedy. And they went and checked in in Dallas in a motel. And Jack Ruby actually came into the room. And she told all of that under oath. And not for me. She had told that. And then I got her as a witness in this, this case I was involved in where she repeated the same thing. Um, she also said Jerry Patrick Hemmings was there in the car caravan. Well, I was in Florida and foolishly called him. This is the phone book. And I called him. I didn't really realize he was about six, six and 300 pounds. I called him and said, uh, I want to talk to you about Marita Lorenz's testimony. He said, all right, where are you staying? I told him the name of the hotel. I said, you want to meet me in the lobby in one hour? He said, great. I don't want to be alone with him. I want to be in the lobby with a lot of people. Yeah, ex-CIA guy, right? And, yeah, uh, yeah he, he would kill people. He had, yeah. And he said he had killed people for the CIA. Yeah. And uh, about 15 minutes later, there's a knock on my door. 15 minutes later, not in the lobby, not an hour later, 15 minutes later, knock on my open, and there he is. And he's huge. And he said, don't worry, I'm not armed. And I said, what do you need guns for? Look like, at you, you can throw it out of a window. I said, um, why don't we go downstairs and go for a walk? I said, all right. We went down there, and we went to the lobby, and then it's a Fountain Blue Hotel. It's a whole big area with grass and big, big back. back. It's not just a backyard. It's a huge, huge acreage behind it. We were walking there. I tried to stay in places where there were a number of people. He kept on going to places where <laughs> there weren't too many people. And uh, I was looking for a way out of there. And I said, I've got to tell you this. Marita Lorenz told me that she was in a two-car caravan that went to Dallas, carried guns, you were involved, and you all killed President Kennedy. He said, that's not true. I said, okay, what's true? He said, it was a three-car caravan. That was his denial. Later, Sturgis, who was part of that also, he was a CIA guy, was, uh, was also involved in that. And he was in New York, and he called Marita, and according to her, he said to her, you know, we were, you, you left too soon that day. We did it. She said, you what? We killed him. So they're all dead now. Nothing's going to happen, obviously. But uh, that's the stuff that's in the book, because that's the stuff I was told at the time and said it at the time when they were around, if they wanted to deny it, but they didn't really. Any speculation as to why were they receiving orders? Was this something they just thought up themselves? The CIA did it. I don't think... Uh, I don't know why. You'd have to ask them, but they're not, probably not alive. If they're alive, they're not going to tell us. Uh, I do know that one of the problems that they had was that John Kennedy was ending the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He had withdrawn 1,000. We had 18,000. They called them observers then, but they weren't observers. They were troops. Uh, 18,000 there. In September 63, he withdrew 1,000. We were down to 17,000. In November... He was meeting with the cabinet, and he sent an associate out to tell the press he was withdrawing 1,000 more that day in November, about a week before he was killed, mm -hmm. and that the rest would all be out of Vietnam by the end of the next year. And uh, this was the CIA's war. As they used to say at Langley, Virginia, where they're located, it's a dirty little war. It's the only one we've got. Mm -hmm. In any event, he was, he was apparently about to end that war, and then... He was killed. Within a few days, the troops started going back. Soon, we had not from 18 to 16,000, 500,000 troops. More than 50,000 Americans died after John Kennedy died. They died in Vietnam, and they would not have been there if Kennedy had been alive. So it's, it's not a little murder mystery about who killed the president. It has, some, it has a lot to do with history and what kind of country you are, and where we are now, and where we've been, and what we can do to change that. Do you fear for President Obama's life? Mr. Bolden was here a few weeks ago, and he was saying he fears greatly for his life. Abraham Bolden, by the way, folks, uh, first African-American Secret Service agent, handpicked by John F. Kennedy himself. Do you fear for Mr. Uh, Obama's then, uh, life? Uh, yes, and of course, Bolden then, when he heard there was a Warren Commission, called and said he wanted to tell him the truth about the White House detail. They were talking about, I'll never take a bullet for him. 
He's an end lover. He destroyed America with his civil rights, etc. White House detail assigned to protect him. And Bolden wants to tell that to the Warren Commission. Instead, they arrested him, arrested him, mm -hmm. framed him, and sent him to prison. Despicable. And, uh, yeah. And it could be one of the truth to be known. So what was the question? Well, I, I do fear for his life. Do you fear for Mr. Oh, Obama's Obama. life? Because uh, of what just happened with the Secret Service being call, recalled. Uh, the same thing's happening over and over again. Uh, it's unbelievable how history repeats itself. Secret Service was drunk uh, the night before the Kennedy assassination. This testimony by Rowley, who was the chief of the Secret Service before the Warren Commission, uh, and he testified that, first of all, the rules were, if you're on the White House detail, you're on call all the time, and you cannot even have a sip of alcohol. If you do, you will be automatically fired. Okay, so now we have Rowley's testimony before the Warren Commission. Nine of them were drunk that night. Well, drunk, he didn't say drunk. Nine of them went to a bar, and it stayed open until two o'clock when they had to leave. Some had scotch, some had beers, and then they went to a place called The Cellar, which he said did not serve booze, but it did. I looked into that. It did serve booze. Why do you think? He said it was mostly folk songs. Yes, the Secret Service agents, after drinking and being kicked out of a bar at 2 o'clock, went to hear folk songs. Right. And I have some land in Florida. It may be a little damp, but if you're interested, I could uh, like to tell you about that. But uh, the uh, so that's, that, that's then, and then... They ask, this is Dave Lee Rankin, counsel for the Warren Commission, yeah. talking to Rowley, the chief of the Secret Service. Have you taken any action against them? Well, I think now they understand what they did. And it would be wrong to penalize them in any way because the public might think they did something wrong and their wives and their children could suffer. That was the background for what took place recently with the Secret Service. They don't punish them. When they do this, it's grounds for being automatically dismissed from the Secret Service when you're on the White House detail. And instead, they got rid of Bolden because he was trying to tell the truth about it. You know, it's, I told Mr. Bolden, I said, it's almost like they get on the Secret Service detail at the White House. They think it's a damn frat party, you know? Um, well, it is, it is. They go wild. Uh, I just saw on CompuServe today uh, the prostitute who called the, 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 in Colombia, who called the police. And uh, they didn't just a picture of her. But uh, I mean, everybody knows who it is now. And uh, it's not a question of these guys bringing a girl to their room, a hooker or not a hooker, makes no difference. It's, it's, this is all secret where they're staying. Everything about what the White House detail does, the president's life is in their hands. That's right. And uh, of course, Obama keeps on saying he has faith in them. Uh, I want to send him a copy of some books I've written. I don't know why he has faith in them, but uh, it, the problem is. What else can you say? They're protecting your children. They're protecting yeah. your wife. They're protecting you. What are you going to say? These guys are terrible. Where do you get the new group from? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a problem. It's an ongoing problem. Yes, I, the day he ran, I was concerned about yeah. his life, but I thought he wouldn't get elected. So I thought that wasn't going to be a problem. He got elected. Of course, I'm concerned. Everybody, but, but it's a long time now, and he's still here, and, and uh, thank God for that. I don't thank the Secret Service, but uh, for some reason, he's still here, which is good. Very, very good. Very happy to see you after all this time to talk to you on the radio. Me too. And, and just call and and we'll set up another one on any time you want. I'm here. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, folks, we've been speaking to Living History Tonight. Mark Lane has been our guest. We've been discussing the Kennedy assassination. Just let me read some of this stuff. Another thing I'd like to get to is your uh, experience with Oprah Winfrey without question and okay. martin sheen uh, and paul mccartney okay. and i can go on again folks because living history tonight and once again i want to reiterate i want to tell you one thing about martin sheen far away okay i, love I this have too. i have uh been so moved and inspired by martin sheen's life he's a famous actor he was given the highest award available to an american catholic um for his service and here he is a, a distinguished actor and he has put his life on the line so many times so mm -hmm. for what he believes in and so i asked him to do the introduction to my book and he did and it amazed me when he said let me just read this one thing it's from his new book uh, citizen lane folks and it's, it's from the jacket which is a quote from martin sheen's introduction 
it's not really egotistical to read it, but it moves me. Mark Lane's life, written over the years with deeds, not words, has been an inspiration for many of us. And he is the reason that I am an activist for the powerless. Nothing moved me much more than that in the, my recent, recent lifetime than Harry Martin Sheen, who I have always, and I never knew this was his position, mm -hmm. who uh, then told me he read Rush to Judgment and it changed his life. Yep. And that he felt he could do that too because of what I had done. And nothing has inspired me more than to know that the people sometimes hear about what you've done and think, well, I can do something like that too. Because that's what my autobiography, autobiography is about. Everybody can do anything. Anybody can do anything. And hey, you've inspired know that, us all. And they should do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they should do it. I can't say it any better than that, folks. Uh, Mark, Mark Lane has been our guest tonight. www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on the book covers associated with tonight's guests. Uh, guests and uh, that'll take you right to a spot where you can order these books from the comfort of your own home. And they'll all be there. Plausible Benial, uh, Rush to Judgment, and uh, Executive Action, the movie. Mark, I want to thank you for coming on the show and inspiring us once more. Well, thank you. I really have always enjoyed talking to you. And now for the first time I see you, I enjoy seeing you. And I like this idea of Skype. This is the first time I've ever done it. It's, you've, done it, other, you've done other shows, I know, right? Uh, absolutely. And you know what? I'm new to Skype, too. It's only been a little yeah. over a year. And what happened, my nephew's down in Stanford. I'm going to plug my nephew, Tyler. He's in aerospace and my other nephew's in medicine at McGill. That's why I have oh. my McGill cup. I'm waiting right. for my Stanford cup from Tyler. And... Um, uh, he said, Stanford, Stanford University in California. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, I spent some time out there. Uh, did you really? Yeah. yeah. There's another um, story for next time. You yeah. see that? <laughs> That's why I love Mark Lane. Uh, all I have to say is he turned me on to Skype and, um, sometimes we'll spend four or five hours, uh, talking, uh, just back and forth, just back and forth. Uh, he's just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And, uh, it's all free folks. And that's what I really love about Skype. It's bringing people together more and more and more and um that's what the world's all about getting smaller and getting together and realizing that we're we really are all connected one way or the other mark thank you so much for your continued continued service to the world and i can't say enough thank you so much my friend thank you so much for inviting me i enjoyed it very much me too sir see you later okay absolutely i'm brent holland from night fright see you all next time Thank you.